put out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Everybody, welcome to Energy Week with George Harvey and the amazing Tom Fennell. In the flesh. In the flesh. And if you can't see us, don't be disheartened. We can't see each other. We're well, we uh, see you either. <laughs> We're doing this show by telephone from home, and I must say that I'm glad to have Tom back on. We missed him the last couple of weeks, and the only the only advantage that we had in the show was that my face was visible, and I'm pretty sure that from the point of view of advantage, that's not an advantage. Anyway, this is Energy Week number 365, and it is um, being recorded on the 2nd of April, 2020, and we will start um, on March 26th. And I want to say, um, if, you want to, if you want to read more on any of these, you can go to geoharvey.com, G-E-O-H-A-R-V-E-Y.com, click on the date, we're starting on the 26th of March, um, and that'll give you 15 uh, or so um, items to, to search through to find the specific um, article that you want. You can also go to uh, the, the website, which is, which is linked at the, at, um, at the re- recording of this particular show, which BCTV does on their website, and it's put up on YouTube and so forth. So we're starting on the 26th of uh, March, and we have a picture of a wind turbine blade being attached from inside the rotor. Yeah, it looks like it's a big picture window, and it's not. It's a hole. (laughs) It looks like the biggest porthole that ever happened. And you can see on the right, you can see the parts of a crane, and that woman's standing there, and she's got to connect about 150 little bolts. Yeah. (laughs) So she's going to be busy this afternoon. I think she is, yes. Okay, what do you got for a title, Tom? Well, the title of the picture says Attaching a Blade, and the title of the article says Wind Capacity Grows by Over 60% in 2019. I'm going to correct you, Tom. It says gigawatts. Huh? What did I say? You said percent. Oh, it does say gigawatts. Um, And... And the synopsis says, uh, this, by the way, is from ReNews, and the synopsis says global wind energy capacity increased by over 60 gigawatts in 2019, making it the second highest year for new installations, according to a report from the Wind, uh, I'm sorry, Global Wind Energy Council. The 15th edition of the Global Wind Report said year-on-year growth in 2019 was 19%. With 60.4 gigawatts installed, that's a lot of that's a lot of gigawatts. Well, you've heard me say on this uh, show before, gig means big. That's right. <laughs> As a quick takeaway here, the report says that the main driver for growth was market-based mechanisms. Yes. Yeah. Which is interesting. It is indeed. Yep. And we've we've also mentioned in the past. <clears throat> uh, I talked about capacity factors and. The wind wind turbines. If you're lucky, you're going to get a 50% capacity factor. If you're not so lucky, it's it might be as as low as 35. But this is the capability of the uh, of the wind fo- wind farms to generate electricity. Right, and nuclear power has a 90% or so capacity factor in the United States. It's more like 80 or so. I'm going to say 92, 93 in the United States. 83 or 84 in the rest of the world. So putting up 60 gigawatts of wind of wind capacity is like putting up 30 large size nuclear power plants. The times they are a change. They are indeed. You got more on that one, Tom? Well, it just says emerging markets in Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, and Southeast Asia showed only moderate growth. Most of this growth is occurring in the more advanced markets. Right. And, and the UK is, is in the top spot. Yeah, I'm not surprised. They're, they're putting in wind energy. I noticed, by the way, today that um, a note uh, went into the news, and we'll have it next week, about 
Um, the the um, UK is closing its last coal burning power plant. We would have a party. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we have a picture of um, – it's the picture is titled, Depending on Coal, which is a title I gave it. Okay. Um, it's a picture. And it's kind of a murky picture of a city in China. I think that's what it is. But that coal-burning power plant is gigantic. Look at the size of that thing. It is that. It is that. <laughs> and this is from the Sydney Morning Herald. And what the article says – well, the picture of Depending on Coal, that was what you said, right? Yeah. And the article says coal power remains in global decline despite Chinese surge. The impact of coronavirus has prompted a surge in coal-fired power plant construction permits in China, with the government issuing more permits in a couple of weeks in March than it did all of last year. However, would-be developers are having difficulty getting financing. And it looks to me like it's not such a great surge in China. I'm looking at this thing and I'm having a problem. I can't get another page. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm working off a PDF and, and apparently it's all, only only copied the first page. Let me, I'm going to have to switch to a uh, a Word document. Do that, or you could go online and go to the go to the. I, can, I got the Word document right here, so okay, a couple of clicks. I got exactly the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I got the Sydney Morning Herald. I got that one. Okay. And you, you have you read the uh, have you read the blurb? Yes, uh, yes I have. The, the would be developers are having difficulty finding financing? Yes. Okay. And, and I said it sounds to me like it's not such a great surge. Well, leaders have toughened their stance against fossil fuels as prices for renewables continue fall. Yeah, we're going to see some more of that later in this show. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, we got another one coming up here. We've got a picture of Science of the Times. That's right. Um, this is from Clean Technica. Okay. Got a title? It says, uh, Nature is trying to tell us something. Is there anybody listening? The coronavirus has upended our society. The head of the Federal Reserve predicts a 50% reduction in America's GDP in the second and third quarters this year with unemployment of 30% or more. Meanwhile, Donald Trump, uh, President Trump, is pushing for the pandemic to be over by Easter. Now, remember, this, this was something that appeared last Thursday, which is a week ago today. Things have changed a lot since then. And yeah, yeah, they have. Huh? Yeah, they have. Yeah, they have. And Easter, for what it's worth, is Sunday, April 12th. That's coming quick. It's coming quick, the 12th, yeah. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with unemployment, but I saw this morning that 6.5 million people had, had filed, which is the, the highest. It, it's double uh, the previous week, and the, that week was a record that was just astonishing compared to anything that had ever happened before. So we've had 10 million people apply for unemployment in a two-week period. Well, this is a great unknown. There's going to be all sorts of consequences of this. Yeah, but Donald Trump is no longer pushing for the pandemic to be over by Easter. In fact, he said he would be doing a really good job if only 100,000 people die. Oh, that's nice. Isn't it? You want to move on, Tom? Well, there's a quick takeaway here. Nature is sending us a message. Yeah. Loss of habitat caused by increasing population and warmer temperatures is forcing humans and animals into closer contact, which yeah. increases the odds that animal-borne diseases will be transmitted to people. Yes, and there's another thing that increases those odds, and it's specific to not just China, but uh, there's a lot of it in China, which is sale of, of wild animals for human food in markets in Chinese cities, and that really does bring wild animals into contact with human beings pretty intimately. They're, they're saying that's a very strong uh, part of the cause of this thing. Yeah, and they don't know what species of animal it came from. I, I've seen some people talk about bats, and I've seen some people talk about pangolins. Yep. And 
pangolins are interesting little creatures. Yeah, they got scales. They have scales, yes. Well, anyway, there you go. All set? Well, let's move up to Friday, March 27th. Good idea. we got a picture here of 1C1. Yes, and this is from Renews. And you can see this is this sort of goes along with the first picture we saw. Sure does. The woman was standing in the cell, and there's a picture right in the middle of the picture is the cell. And it looks like they are in the process here of installing a blade. It sure does. It sure does. So what do you got for title? UK Renewables Task in record 2019. Renewable energy generated a record 37% of the UK's electricity demand in 2019, with wind contributing more than half that amount, according to new statistics released by the UK government. Onshore and offshore wind farms each contributed 9.9% of the total amount of electricity generated. Well, this uh, Hornsey plant is located 50 miles off the Yorkshire coast, the east coast of yeah. England, yeah. in the North Sea. Yeah. And it's the largest offshore wind farm in the world. Yes. And they, they have great plans to build more there. They're... <laughs> They're, they're building offshore wind farms like crazy. And, you know, they, they didn't want onshore wind farms spoiling the, the beautiful kind of rustic uh, feel of, of, um, of the English countryside. And having lived there, I can understand that. Um, but on the other hand, you know, if you're – England is not going to – the UK, Scotland, none of those countries is going to be the same in the future because of climate change. They're all they're all, all already changing enormously. Absolutely. So let's move along here. We got a picture of a solar farm. It's a hard, big solar farm. And it's a what solar farm? Very large. I think I think this is a large solar farm. Yeah, I think Tom, you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is from a new economy. What well, says A E M O? Warns any further delays in renewables transition could hit gas supplies. This is an if you're wondering what AEMO is, you're going to tell us. I, I believe I will. It's Australia's energy market operator. That's the, the the equivalent, I think, of an ISO, like we have ISO New England, which. Exactly the same. It's the yeah. We determine pretty much how to dispatch the power to us. Right. And Australia's energy market operator has warned that any delays to at least 30 gigawatts and up to 47 gigawatts of new renewable energy capacity required to realize, it, realize its draft integrated system plan could force it to lean more heavily on costly and polluting gas. And of course, this is interesting because if they lean more on, on, on natural gas, it means that, that <clears throat> the price of natural gas is gonna go up and it's not gonna be available to households. So. You know, they're they're pushing to get this. They're, they want to make sure that this is not stopped <clears throat> for political reasons or because of the coronavirus. Yep. Well, the key message out of this one is there is no time to lose. Yes, I think that's true. But the thing that I found interesting about it was they need to have this capacity, this new renewable capacity that's on the bo on the books is coming along. <clears throat> in order to save on natural gas. So I thought that was an interesting, interesting um, uh, situation. Well, let's move along here. Okay. The, the picture here is, is of tribal land. It's really quite a pretty picture. It is. This is, uh, this is apparently on the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. <clears throat> and uh, we have an, the, the item is from Clean Technica. Federal judge rules permits for Dakota Access Pipeline are invalid. Yeah, this is there's, something. There's I more can't... happening on this one. <laughs> this is this is kind of amazing, um, and and in a sense, I have to call it a comeuppance for the company that put this in there because they started construction without the permits, despite the fact that the Indian Reservation wanted this thing not to be there. Um, but basically, the permits were were eventually given. Now. This reads, even though the Dakota Access Pipeline has been completed and placed into service, 
a federal judge ruled this week that all environmental permits for it were granted without adequate review or input from the indigenous communities impacted by it. So that's kind of a problem. They've spent a lot of money, they've got the thing running, and it's not legal. Well, the judge has ordered the Corps of Engineers to conduct, conduct a full environmental review, re- review of the yeah. project, which they could have done. They, they should have done, yes. And he's con- considering whether the, the invalidity of the permits means the pipeline should be shut down. Yes. So this could have big impacts. Oh, yeah, this is, could, have, could have big impacts. But you know what, Tom? I wonder whether that pipeline is ever going to be paid off, even in the best conditions for it. Even well, if- times are changing, and they didn't anticipate, I think, the uh, fact that natural gas particularly frack natural gas, is expensive to produce. Yes. We'll be talking about that again later. We will, and we'll also be talking about the price of oil hitting ridiculous figures. Yep. And at, at those figures, that pipeline might as well just not be used. Thank you. Okay, we're up to Saturday, March um, 28th, and we have an item here from uh, Clean Technica. It is a picture of a car on a train. <laughs> Taken from right next to the car. Volvo moves to rail transport to reduce carbon emissions. It's an interesting article. It is a very interesting article. Volvo is just one of the many companies switching from over-the-road trucks to rail transport to move cars from its factories to storage depots across Europe, China, and the United States. The switch to rail reduced CO2 emissions emissions rather by nearly 75% on one European delivery route. And on another route, the emissions were cut by half. Yeah. And, you know, the choice is, are you going to send these things out by rail or are you going to send them by truck? And by truck means you're not carrying very many in each load, and each load takes a a lot of oil. I'm surprised they haven't done this by, by themselves just for economic reasons. Well, I'm kind of surprised, too. The rail systems in Europe have been... I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong about this, but my They're recollection. They're ours. Huh? Yeah, much better. My recollection was that the rail systems in Europe were absolutely amazingly good, but you got to bear in mind that that recollection goes back um, 58 years. Um, they they were really good when I was just amazing. They were so good, and uh, now I would I would I would think that they'd still be moving things by rail, but you know. Apparently, those those companies had switched to trucks. So well, they're switching back to rail. I guess. I guess. That's what that's what this article is telling us. Yeah, absolutely. You well, in the U.S., uh, Volvo's South Carolina is starting to take new cars by rail to depots in cities across North America. Yeah. And what happens? Of course, they make the cars in Europe. They bring them over here, and a lot of them go to New Jersey. You can see if it's there where there's thousands of cars stacked up. And that's close to rail, so what they're just do, doing now is put them on, uh, put them on trains. I, mean, I don't understand why people have been tra- moving stuff by truck, really. I mean, tr- there's, there's reasons why you would move stuff by truck, but it seems that a lot of things that are moved by truck could be moved by rail. Yeah. Well, I think they're finding that out. Yeah. Okay. Well, we got another picture here of some solar panels in China. You're looking like they're in a park. It looks like that. Yeah. It certainly does. Now, this is from Smart Energy. Renewable set to win during China's COVID-19 lockdown. In China, lower demand for electricity during the COVID-19 uh, downturn has effects on power generation, has affected power generation sectors unevenly. Thermal power generation dropped 9% year-on-year during the first two months of the year, but wind generation increased by 1%, and solar is up 12 And, of course, what that means is they could permit all the plants they want, but they're not going to do anything if they can't sell electricity. Bingo. Yeah. You got anything else on that, Tom? Uh, not, not, not anything really of great significance, so let's move on. Okay. Um, 
And we had a picture of, of Chicago, and we got a picture of Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> yes. U.S. renewable energy increases in 2019. Incre- well, I, I emphasis on the word increases. Right. And this is from North American Wind Power, which, of course, we could accuse rightfully of tooting its own horn. I think that they would admit that. But uh, here's the synopsis. The uh, production of U.S. energy from solar sources increased by 13.85% in 2019, while output from wind power grew by 10.06%, according to a Sunday campaign analysis of newly released data from the Energy Information Administration's um, latest issue of monthly uh, energy review. Well, it kind of reveals that half. Well, for for the first time, energy from solar sources topped one percent of the total U.S. energy production. Yeah, we have to be clear. The wind reached nearly three percent. Yeah, we have to be clear about this. There is the percentage of electricity generated, and there is separately the percentage of energy. And when you're dealing with electricity. Um, you get very much higher percentages because solar and wind is generating basically just electricity. But when you're dealing with energy, you have to include the gasoline you put in your car. You have to include the propane you, you use to cook your dinner, um, diesel oil that used to drive trucks and so forth. Everything, that's, everything is included in that, the home heating. Not just electricity. Yeah. So – the figures that I keep in my mind are are figures for the the figures I usually have in my mind are the ones that relate to electricity, and um, the the growth in um, solar and wind power is I don't know I think I think solar and wind power are probably they're about to be to, renewables in general including hydropower and so forth are are contributing about twenty percent. And I really expect that that is that they're probably going to top the output of coal by the end of the year. Well, it makes makes sense just for economic reasons. Yeah, that's right. And we have um, part of the story of it's making sense coming up in this this next item, which is from Sunday, March 29th. But do you have more on that one? Uh, no. Let's let's move on to the next one. Picture of a unit train. Yeah. This, in Wyoming. In Wyoming. Although you can tell this is eastern Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is flat, no mountains. Wyoming. Remind, that unit train reminds me of a time was about 20 years ago. I took uh, a rail out to the west coast. Yeah. Got on Amtrak. It just kept going, stopped in Chicago, went through the Dakotas. And an interesting thing that I, that I noticed then was the passenger train took second fiddle to these unit trains of coal. They would put us in a siding while this unit train went by. Really? Which I wouldn't expect. I would have figured that the people took priority. Well, I'm not surprised in a sense because I had a I had an uncle. He was actually my my grandmother's brother who worked on the rail system in the United States. I'm going to say probably just before the First World War. And he worked on silk trains that would carry the silk from ports, uh, I think it was uh, Seattle, uh, to New York City. And they wanted that silk to move as fast as it could possibly go. And they even sidelined express passenger trains. Well, that's what was happening with the coal trains. Yeah, yeah. Although, I don't know, it's not going to happen much longer, I don't think. Okay. Well, there's a little bit here of informational stuff that I will pass on. Yeah. It came from the article, and it explains some, some things that we have been talking about. But, Tom, we, old, huh? we haven't read the title and the, and the synopsis yet. Oh, <laughs> we're getting ahead of me. Let's get a U.S. Look. coal exports declined in 2019. Right. And this is from the, Ber- uh, the Beckley Register Herald. Um, in 2019... U.S. coal exports exports fell to 93 million short tons, down 20% from the previous year. That's a big decline. The Energy Information Administration's annual coal report provided this information. Steam coal exports were affected by the downturn in global, um, most affected 
uh, dropping 30% in 2019 from 2018. But metallurgic coal, what they call met coal, was down 12%. And, you know... Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm just, that's just what I was going to cover. Yeah. Uh, Beckley, Beckley, for what it's worth, happens to be at the heart of the West Virginia coal mining area. Yeah, okay. And uh, what, this is what I was going to tell you. Steam coal, also known as thermal coal, is used for electricity generation and space heating for homes and businesses. Right. Metallurgical coal is used to produce coke, a primary fuel and reactant in a blast furnace process for steel making. Right. So demand for metallurgical coal is correlated with the demand for that steel. Yes. And most metallurgical coal comes from Appalachia. Right. And that's important. To the to the people of West Virginia, that's important. Well, yeah. Uh, employs most of the people in that part of West Virginia by quite a yeah. quite a big degree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's move along here. We have a picture of a very snazzy uh, truck. Yeah, I like that one. Called <laughs> out of date and just a little bit obsolete. Well, that again was my title. <laughs> this comes from Intercom Inc. Exxon may crush bailout hopes. For suffering cracking companies, this is significant. This is this shows you what's going on. We, you know, different people have got different ideas about what to do. In a remarkable inter- interview on March 26th, CEO Scott Sheffield of shale firm Pioneer Natural Resources gave great clarity to why shale companies are unlikely to get bailed out and why the American Petroleum Institute has been touting free markets and opposing the bailout. Well, yeah, it's easy to tout the free market when you can destroy, you can use it to destroy your competition. Well, this is an interesting takeaway from it, or, or, or a sideline. Yeah. There's about 74 independent scale companies. Yes. There's only going to be about 10 of them left at the end of 2021. That's the rest what, of them are going to become ghosts or zombies. Yeah, that's that's basically what they're predicting. And it's saying they're deeply indebted and they're losing billions of dollars. Yeah, they're well. You know, this is something that it, it's it, it's really almost. I I feel sympathy for people who are in working in this business because it's an expensive business. Shale is oil is not inexpensive. Uh, to produce, it's a business that that um, um, has been under pressure because of a whole variety of problems. The amount of money they've got to put into drilling, the the fact that the wells don't go, you don't keep producing very long. Well, that's a big disappointment. They're uh, they're not producing anywhere near what they predicted. Yeah, and then on top of everything else, these people have got have got debts they have to pay. They've got bondholders, and all of a sudden comes along the the coronavirus, which cuts demand, and then comes along this trade war between Saudi Arabia and Russia, in which they're supposedly shooting at each other, but somehow the bullets come at us. <laughs> this is. Uh... This is kind of an interesting thing. It, look, it, it looks like Exxon is going to wind up buying up all these independent shale companies. And, and basically, they've been speculating. Yeah. And you know what? If Exxon is going to bail these guys, is going to buy up those companies, they're going to buy them up for its, almost literally for a song. Pennies on a dollar. Pennies on the dollar? Do you think it'll be as much as a penny? <laughs> You know there have been there have been shale oil companies that have gone broke, and they have uh, I'm sorry, coal companies have done this. They've gone broke and offered up their assets for sale and no bidders. No bidders for it. Nobody even wants them. Huh? And this is going to happen to the shale companies too. And then you've got the problem of they've they've created a big pond of petroleum, a thing that ducks land in and die, and you know. Who's going to clean that up? I'm not. Well, I'm not either. So, well, let's move along here and take a picture of 
misinformation. And, and that's what she was. You'll you'll see that misinformation is actually part of the picture. Well, that's just what I'm going to say. Yeah. Misinformation kills. I'm not talking about her. Yeah, well. The link between climate denial and coronavirus conspiracy. Yeah. Uh, Misinformation is being spread. Scientific warnings are being ignored. And leading Republicans have said that addressing the problem is either too expensive or too difficult. No, this isn't climate change. This is the new reality of the novel coronavirus. Uh, things have changed since this <laughs> since this particular news item appeared. Well, with the articles, the article is not knocking conspiracy theories. Yeah. Conspiracy theories and fake news have been on the rise. Yes, they the have. Bio theories hide a larger problem: widespread skepticism about the severity crisis. So spreading of misinformation can put yeah. people in danger. Well, the yeah. bottom line is we don't really know what's going on. No, we don't. And and I've seen a couple of articles about that. One of them was, I forget the man's name, he's the head uh, health uh, official in France, and he said the numbers are just wrong. He said there, the, the number, there are people who die at home, and there are people who die in other places, and they're not even being counted in the death, uh, coronavirus deaths. And he he said but they didn't go to the hospital. Th that's right. But one of the things that he said that surprised me, and then when I read on in the article, I found that this was true not only in France, but in most places, including the United States. If people die in nursing homes, they're very likely not going to be added to that list. Uh huh. And you know this is a. Uh, this is a serious problem. On the other hand, <clears throat> this particular virus, it, 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 I, I never realized until this thing came along how delicate viruses are. Uh -huh. If you wash your hands, if you've got the virus on your hands and you wash them, you, what you're doing is you're, the soap you're using, assuming that you're washing with soap, which you should, is going to remove a layer of fat on the outside of the virus that protects it from being oxygenated. Oh! Once it gets out into the air and is exposed to the air, it's it's only going to last for minutes before it's gone. So washing your hands makes a lot of sense. Washing your hands, and you know, they used to say, wash your hands, if you want to sanitize your hands, wash your hands for a minute in hot water. With this thing, they're saying, wash your hands for at least 20 seconds in water with soap. And what that tells me is that the kinds of things that you're trying to wash off normally are far more difficult to, to remove than the, than, the, than the virus here. But the one th thing that you have to do is you have to wash your hands thoroughly. You have to get between your fingers and under, uh, under your nails and so forth. Well, and, there's good pericidal soaps out there now and a little, little dispenser bottle. But but any soap will work. Any soap will work. Any soap, because what you're doing is dissolving a minuscule layer of fat. And once that's gone, that virus is uh, is uh, kind of in hopeless shape. Hopeless for it. Let's move along, Monday, March 30th. Oh, I should say, by the way, that item came from Grist. Yes, Monday, March 30th. Interesting uh, article here from Clean Tech. That, that picture there, when I looked at it, I thought it was a cell phone. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a very large automobile battery. It's about six feet long by three feet wide. Yeah, and, and it fits to the floor of the car. Yeah, and it—I I don't know. I'm just going to guess it's six or eight inches thick. This is yeah, something like that. Not small. <laughs> it looks like something that could fit into a cell phone. It almost looks like a cell phone battery. But um, anyway, this is from Clean Technica. What do you have for title? Well, it's interesting here because. Uh, there's been problems with batteries, and this is uh, talking about that. Yes. So BYD, which we talked about, Build Your Dreams, it means. Yes. The Chinese company unveils new fire-resistant and explosion-resistant blade battery. BYD announced its new blade battery. The company says it can withstand all sorts of punishments that cause ordinary lithium battery cells to burn or explode. These are things like being punctured by a nail, crushed, bent, heated to 300 degrees Celsius, or overcharged by 260%. Well, what they're saying here is many people are nervous about electric cars. Yeah. Very able short circuit in a car wash or heavy rain or burst into flames in a garage at any time. 
Yeah, they that's were, kind of not likely. Crazy, but people do believe. Some people believe that. Well, there's one of the things about clean technica is that they're really into uh, electric vehicles, and particularly they're into uh, Teslas, and they've ah. been running articles for for the last couple of years about the fact that if there is a a battery fire in an electric vehicle, it's headline news. Oh yeah, and it's all over the place. Have you ever seen a car burning on a road? Yes. Fully engulfed in fire? Yes. That's a scary sight. And I've, I've seen that happen a number of times. Um, and it's, it's, it's something that's more fearful than, it, than one of these batteries. Far, far more, far, far more. Um, and, and, you know, the other thing is this reminds me a little bit of a friend of mine who was, he was a consultant and he was, uh, he was a, consultant technical consultant and somebody called him up <laughs> somebody called him up one day and said um i'm told that you keep guns is that true and he was a little bit leery about answering that straightforwardly but he did and, and the guy said um uh the person had already identified himself as calling from a from a uh place that needed a, a consultant who could write up a technical problem he said we've got a site that you can use and we've got the equipment, except we don't have somebody who's got a gun, and we want you to come and shoot a battery. Wow. <laughs> so he, he, brought, <laughs> he brought a little pistol. It was a three eighty, and if you don't know 380s, they're not terribly powerful. They're actually not powerful at all. It's kind of a, a, a gun to carry in a purse or something like that. Yeah, it's a very popular gun with women who carry guns, and there's a surprising number of them. But... Um, the the uh, he showed up with a 380 and he shot the battery. He said within a minute it was on fire. Wow! Now that was a, a fair amount of time ago, and that was a problem that Tesla has already addressed to a very large extent. So this is this business of batteries burning that easily is just not the issue that it would have been if if technology had not been updated. Well, that's what this article is about, really. Yes. And this is the future of batteries. This battery just looks like it's in, in, in maybe better than other things that are out there. But, you know, you never know until things come to market and they, they are able to, uh, to go with them. Well, let's move on here. we got another one coming up. Yeah, this is a picture of Alberta tar sands. Isn't that, doesn't that look like something you'd like to have in your backyard? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's pretty horrible. It's horrible. I, I, I look took a look at the uh, article. Yeah. We didn't put the picture up, but there's a picture of the tar sands in 1984 and the uh -huh. tar sands today. Yeah. And they're about five times as big. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. It really is. And if you look at this picture, you'll see about halfway up on the right side, there are areas that are blue. And I, I kind of suspect that those are ponds that are very badly polluted with oil. I would argue that. I bet you're right on the money. Just a suspicion. Well, let's see what it says here. No one is buying Canada's oil. <laughs> a preview of the near future new normal. Yep, this is from uh, Clean Technica. As Saudi Arabia and Russia engage in a price war, lower grades of oil are, get, are getting hard to sell. One result is that Alberta's crude oil is selling for less than it costs to ship. Western Canada Select, a domestic heavy oil benchmark, has come in at $4.58 U.S. per barrel. And, you know, Tom, when I, when I first saw the, the, these figures, somebody had, had forwarded me um, an article, and, and I didn't put it in the blog because I didn't believe it. And I went out looking at, you know, general um, benchmark oil prices, and I didn't see 4.58 a barrel. And then this came into Clean Technica, and I said, "Wow, you know, did, did Steve Hanley, the the author? I think it was Steve Hanley was the author. Did he did he get fooled? And so I thought, you know, what I should do is I should look specifically for Western Canada Select. And when I did that, I found that at the time I was looking, it was five dollars and ten cents. And you know, th this is this is astonishing. I haven't seen four dollar and fifty eight cent oil since before 1973 you know i mean this is like i don't know it's 
it, it, it's amazing what this is doing to the shale companies. And we were just talking about that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of it was has been speculation. People looking to make a quick buck. Yeah. And it ain't happening. Well, yeah, there was a lot of speculation, as you said, and there was a lot of people who raised a lot of money, and a lot of money has been lost, and there will be more money lost. Let's move along here. We'll take a look at a whole bunch of West Virginia coal miners. Who I think are probably all out of work now. They may very well be. Yeah. Coal miners coronavirus calamity. This is from miningjournal.com. The troubled Pan Pacific coal miner Coronado Global Resources had to idle its Central Appalachian thermal and metallurgical coal mines. It blamed the COVID-19 induced economic downturn in much of the world. All hourly employees will be laid off. Essential salaried workers will keep working. Now, those essential salaried workers are people who are working in offices to process things. And yeah, they're not underground. They're not underground, and they have jobs that if they if they just stop working, the, the place would go belly up. So I don't know. This is interesting. That uh, picture from the article is in the is the Buchanan mine. Yeah. And that's the mine I've been down in. Oh, really? Yeah. Only about four feet tall. Yeah, you told us that. Before. Yeah. Yeah. They give you hammers to use as crutches. <laughs> yes. I would come out of a thing like that with an enormous backache, I think. <laughs> well, uh, what did I read? Did I even read it? Coal miners, coronavirus, we read coronavirus calamity. Yeah. We read that. We're up to Tuesday, March 31st, and we've got a, an interesting picture here of an offshore, of offshore wind power. Yeah, we do. That yeah. big yellow thing is the uh, basically the headquarters. That's where all of the all of the cables go to that rig. Yeah, and they're all combined, and one big cable takes it to the shore. Right. And that, if you notice, on the left side of that big yellow thing, there's a there's a thing with a flat top that's hanging off the side, and that is a place for helicopters. To yeah, live. sure, absolutely. Um, that. Rig looks smaller than a lot of rigs I've seen. It looks to me like it's probably about four stories from the bottom of where people might walk to the top of it. So it means I'm, what I'm saying is well, it's, it's, that's basically a hotel. Yeah. I mean, people live there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's read what it says. Northland makes Canadian shore move. Uh, this is from Renews. Northland Power, a Canadian company, is to buy an early-stage offshore wind development from Nikon Wind Energy Group off British Columbia, Canada. The deal, which is expected to close in mid-2020, will see Northland take up 100% ownership of the Nikon offshore wind farm. I included this in my blog and in this, um, this week's show because it is – they're talking about offshore wind off the off – the, West coast of North America. Right. There's not a big Atlantic shelf out there. There's a steep Pacific shelf. And uh, there's, there's, a, there's a narrow Pacific shelf, and now they're starting to explore floating turbines. Yes. So we're we're gonna talk about that. I think we're going to see more action out there. Well, and I'm, if you go to this article, you'll find there's some related stories. Yes. They're interesting. Yeah. The Northland Center will work closely with the Haida Nation, the Indian Nation, to explore the project details. And they also mentioned that Northland is, a, is acquiring wind farms in other countries like South Korea. Yeah. Okay, we'll move on. Oh, here we got a nice, interesting picture here. We do indeed. Can you see the solar cell in that picture? <laughs> yeah. Well, what it says here is. Uh, the company wants to turn your windows into solar panels. This is from CNN. What if every window could generate electricity? MIT spin-off Ubiquitous Energy has developed transparent solar cells. Its clear view, uh, uh, clear view power windows are what is called solar glass that turn sunlight into energy without the blue-gray opaque panels we generally associate with solar energy. Um, I was a little... Generation. What? 
It's a new generation. It is. We've basically seen this coming. We we knew a couple of years ago that people we talked about it. Yeah, but um, th- there's two things about this. One of which is that really does look like just plain glass. And the second thing about it is, I was a little disappointed in this article because it really doesn't give much of the technical details about how much energy is being produced and so forth. Not how much, but they do. Well, I do mention this. It, the technology uses an organic dye that can be used to coat glass surfaces. And the dye allows visible sunlight to pass through, just like normal windows, but it captures the invisible infrared rays from the sunlight. It can turn practically, every, practically any everyday glass surface into a solar cell. Yeah. And it says that the transparent panels can produce two-thirds of the energy that traditional panels do. Yeah. And they, they're not very expensive. They cost about 20% more to install than regular plain ordinary glass windows. We, that was from CNN, and we, now we have an item from Clean Technica. Aha! GCL plans to invest $2.5 billion in the world's largest solar panel factory. A report published in, by Power Technology says China's GCL Systems integ- um, Integrated Technology plans to invest more than two and one half billion dollars. A billion with a B, is it? A billion with a B to w- build the world's largest solar um, panel factory. It will reportedly be able to produce enough solar panels to meet half the global demand. Just think about that for a minute. Think about the amount of money that it takes to meet half the global demand. That's two and a half billion dollars, as opposed to the amount of money that it t- takes, which would probably be ten billion dollars, to build one nuclear reactor. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. The article says that this this factory is going to be capable of building sixty gigawatts worth of solar panels annually. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. A gigawatt is big. A gigawatt. Gigawatt. That's right. This well, is, we got another article coming up. It's for the birds. Yeah, this is from Wednesday, April first, and the article is from BBC. And that's a nightingale, in case you're wondering. Yep. And nightingales are wonderful singers. That's what they say. They're uh, the closest thing we have is is our own state bird, which is the hermit thrush. Yeah. And uh, I was listening to uh, uh, recordings of both of these birds, and they sound very much alike. Really? I didn't know that. Now, these the hermit thrushes, they can sing for an hour and not repeat the same song. Really? They're fabulous. When I, had, when I was a little kid, I had a canary, and uh, that canary would sing just the most beautiful song, but it sang the same song over and over again. I over and over it. again. Yeah. Now, these guys are uh, very, very creative. Yeah. So well, what's that for a title? Warning Clips, the Nightingale's Wing. One of the f- world's favorite songbirds may be undergoing some profound physical impact as temperatures rise. Researchers in Spain found that over a 20-year period, nightingales um, had been growing to, to have smaller wingspans. The scientists say this is linked to climate change in the region. The region here being mostly southern England. That's what they're saying, yep. Yeah. The hermit thrush is a state bird, and it's, uh, it even looks like a bird. Yeah. The, the, the Spanish were involved in this because the nightingales, when they, when they migrate, they migrate from, well, northern Europe, but a lot of them are living in, in southern England, and they migrate from there to sub-Saharan Africa every year and back again. So that's why the Spanish were involved, because they were, you know, the nightingales. Going through Spain. Going through Spain, yeah. Okay, more on that? Well, I just said that numbers have declined by 90% over the last half century. Yeah, this is, it, it's, it's really sad. You know, it really is. Okay. Uh, There's a picture cleverly called Cars on the Road. Again, my title. <laughs> it didn't have a title. And you know what I do? I, I save these, these pictures that come with the article to a file, and I have to give the file a name. <laughs> so what okay. you're seeing there is the name of the file I put, I put in. Okay, this is from Benzinga. Benzing? 
Benzinga. Benzinga. Okay. I'll let you. Your, your way is, is more interesting than mine. Benzinga. Benzinga. There you go. Trump has fuel efficiency standards. Wow. Chess cites his foolish Twitter executives on Twitter. Foolish is his word. This is, this, is a, this is astonishing to me. The Trump administration cut fuel standards and ushered in a plan calling for significantly lower annual increases in fuel economy, but not all automakers were happy about this. He had some words for the industry's leadership and called them, quote, foolish executives, end quote. We've talked about this already. We have indeed, but they, they actually, they, when we talked about it before, they were talking about doing this. Now they've done it. Now we've done it. And the, the big thing here is California and a number of states have got a right, which, which was signed into law, um, to have different standards than the federal standards, and the California standards are more, They're more rigid. Uh, more rigid. And this was something that was... That was this was a a I don't actually actually I don't know that it was signed into law but it was agreed to you know it was a, it was a formal agreement and yeah, not, California and a few other many, few other states well it was a different drummer yeah and, Cal- and in California it's understandable they want to clean up the air that's right and California is big enough that if they set standards the auto companies can work on that standard. This is okay, picture. Silver Linings Playbook, Coronavirus Edition. This is a picture of an empty beach, and it was a NASA image. And if you look at that image, Tom, tell me you, you, how NASA managed to take that from outer space. <laughs> anyway, with the pandemic, we're in the middle of a global wake-up call. That's what this article says. But it doesn't mean it's not possible to look forward and see what will be we'll gain by waking up. Some things will be minor compared to the damage of COVID-19, but some things will be major. What are the silver linings? Okay. They've got a whole list here. They sure do. Oh, we got, I guess we've got enough time to read it. Yeah. Well, there's about seven or eight of them here. Okay. First one is the world has awakened to the fragility of oil and gas as underpinnings of the economy. Yes. And the second one, we accept that collective action and sacrifice are necessary to solve global par- problem. Yes. The third one, this is interesting because it's, it's different from the other two, more people are wearing face masks. <laughs> yes. The second one's kind of related to that. The handshake as an indicator of leadership strength is probably dead now. Right. They tell you, don't shake hands. Don't shake hands. You know, I don't even like bumping elbows, which is what some people are doing. Yeah. I hold my hand out from six feet away and say virtual handshake and move it up and down. Interesting. Well, anti-vaxxers, people against vaccines, have mostly shut up. Yes. <laughs> and Trump, this is an interesting one, Trump's likelihood of a return to the Oval Office in November 2020 has diminished. I think, yes. And finally, the last one, our global ability to deal with the next pandemic, and they're, they're assuming it's going to happen, it will be much stronger. Well, I think that's true, and I think we can bet that there will be a pandemic. Um, you know, this problem of what is the, the, bet, the next pandemic, epidemic, whatever, you know, was going to call, come, I've been reading about the next one that was coming for years and years and years. And I remember some time ago reading about the, the thing saying the, it, the article I was reading say, saying it was overdue. We, we have a major pandemic more often than once every century. And, and they gave a number of years. I don't know. It was 84 years or whatever. But they, the, the, the next pandemic was overdue. And they, they were talking about the fact that the United States was not prepared for it. And, you know, the, the situation now, we, we had – Huge numbers of people are not working. Huge numbers of people have filed for unemployment. Um, things are not progressing the way that they normally do. That seems to be the case. Yeah. Well, there's still a lot of uh, conspiracy theories about this. Yes. They found uh, one, the biggest one involves a uh, MIT professor, I think he is, and some Chinese guys that were working with him. 
Yeah. And one of the Chinese guys, this happened back in December, got caught smuggling some uh, unknown chemical compounds. Chemical compounds? Well, they were uh, they were chemical compounds affecting uh, things like pandemics. Really? And he was taking them to Wuhan. That's what the conspiracy theory says. Well, there are facts. The conspiracy theory ties them all together in a sinister manner. Yeah, well, I have a conspiracy theory. Would you like to hear it? Yeah. Donald Trump's father was getting into trouble be- just before he was born with the, with the FBI. And you can look it up. That was going uh, – not the FBI, the, the IRS. So – he wanted to leave the country, so he and his wife went to the Brazilian embassy in um, in uh, Washington D.C. And at, at the embassy, she went into labor prematurely, and Donald Trump was actually born at the embassy on Brazilian soil. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so he's 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 got to come up with um, credentials, just like he wanted uh, Barack Obama to come up with credentials. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you can make these things up. You can just do it, and if we're going to if we're going to operate our government and our e- economics on the basis of made up things, it, it's not going to work. And you'll notice he went from having saying this was going to be stopped at the border, the coronavirus, to saying we need two trillion with a T. T is in Tommy. We need we need two trillion to fight it. He went that that distance in two weeks. Now he says. We're, he's he's going to be really happy if only a hundred thousand people die of it in the United States. Wow! And and you know it's like we the the misinformation that was out there is, is, is the 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 various news organizations that blow Donald uh, Donald Trump's horn for him. Um, we're we're just passing information that was whatever whatever it was, and we're in a complete. But he, the point that I'm trying to make is he put two he promised two trillion dollars into the economy, and what happened to the stock market? Not much. It was kind of saying ho hum. That's that's a contemplate that. That's kind of interesting, <laughs> isn't it? You know. I, I don't know what to say about it. I'm I'm sitting at my computer right now, and I can look at this at the Dow Jones Index. Uh huh. And it is at two twenty thousand nine hundred and ninety five, which is about nine thousand below what it was at the at the peak about six weeks ago. And um, you know, if I look at it for the last month, yeah, there was a there was a little bit of a rise, not a huge rise. When when they started really getting serious about that, but it ha- it it went up from eighteen thousand five hundred to twenty thousand nine hundred. But you know, it's not it's not. You'd think that with two trillion dollars coming, they'd be all excited and happy. But I just don't see. One it. might think, but you know, stuff stuff goes on there that you and I aren't aren't, aren't privy to. Well, that's true. And, you know, the stock market's idea about what's going to happen and everybody else's are two different things. Well, people think of the stock market as a whole bunch of people buying shares. And the reality is that uh, most of the stock market is bought by uh, organization. Yes, that's true. I mean, they're intended, they're they're investor groups, stuff like that. Yeah, mutual funds. uh, Yeah. uh, Retirement funds. Absolutely. Unions. And, and, uh, well, I guess you could call mutual funds uh, agglomerations of investors, but that's yes. what they are. That's what they are, yeah. Okay, Tom, I think we're, we're at the end of our show now. Well, we've done a little bit more than an hour. We've done about an hour and five minutes, so. Including about five minutes that I think Brian's going to have to remove. He's going to have to just cut it off. <laughs> okay, so we'll say goodbye to everybody. And uh, the note is, at the end of this, have a perfectly untroubled week. We hope... Our, That'd be a good idea. Our watchers are able to be careful about the coronavirus and prevent themselves successfully from getting it. Because well, my battery on the phone has survived, which is <laughs> good news. I will. I will uh, predict that it'll it'll be uh, back another day. I think it will. I'm gonna. Well, where I stand, where, where it stands, 
It recharges automatically anyhow. Okay. Well, goodbye, everybody, and come back next time. Adios, amigos.